720 patentes emitidas en Estados Unidos en áreas de servicios de TI, software and hardware, liderando el cambio de eras tecnológicas y haciendo mejoras que representan un impacto en los procesos y la estrategia de la compañía de cara al futuro. Hoy en día es el yo de innovación para clientes dentro de la división de Internet y en los últimos años ha trabajado intensamente para definir mejoras técnicas en la estrategia de Cloud Computation, LOT y Roadmap de Inteligencia Aumentada y Negocios Cognitivos para IBM. Además de liderar equipos multidisciplinarios en todo el mundo, su trayectoria le ha permitido ser coach de empresas, autoridades gubernamentales y organizaciones sobre temas de innovación y propiedad intelectual en más de 30 países. Es apasionado en los temas de economía de la innovación. Disfruta compartir su conocimiento y colaborar con las nuevas generaciones que quieren pensar diferente para mostrar por qué las empresas deben aprovechar la tecnología disruptiva para competir y reducir los costos. Es decir, si una empresa no mejora o reemplaza su propio producto, alguien más lo hará. Démosle un fuerte aplauso a Rich, por favor. Well, thank you. How's my volume? Is it good? Okay. It is fantastic to be here. We're going to have a lot of fun today. We're going to be exploring the future. We're going to be talking about cognitive Internet of Things, or as it will be known in the future, the Internet. So we're talking about the future of the Internet. So to understand the Internet in the future, we have to go back in time. We have to start by understanding the printing press and Johannes Gutenberg and things that happened centuries ago because the printing press allowed the cost of information distribution to go down by an order of magnitude. And so we understand that with the printing press, we move from having books as luxuries for the very few, very rich people. And they became uh, everyday necessities in the lives of many. But if we move forward from there, we look at what happened in our own lifetimes and the rise of the first generation of the internet. The first generation internet allowed intangibles, and allowed information, news and weather, stocks and bonds, tickets for music events, for concerts, for sports, to all be indexed, searched, and to be traded online. And so this pushed the cost of information down to basically zero. And it created these really efficient markets. But the markets were only as good as the intangibles. For industries that had a lot of physical assets, then the internet didn't make as big of a difference. So things like agriculture, things like, uh, uh, things like uh, transportation, things like real estate, what we see is that the internet was not as powerful. But that is about to change because now the internet of things is going to do uh, for physical objects the same thing that the internet did for the virtual world. We're going to have uh, indexable, searchable, and tradable physical assets moving forward. So is there a lot of talk about IoT? The short answer is yes. It's hard to see that type up there. So Eric Schmidt, the Google chairman, says, once the internet is infused down into the physical world, it's going to become part of our presence all the time. And Bosch, the German company who's been very involved in IoT, says that virtually every object around us can be uh, networked and can be intelligent. Finally, Wired Magazine says that IoT gives us uh, the most disruption and the most opportunity of any technology out there. So yes, there's a lot of hype about IoT today, but the fact is that already companies and organizations are getting real tangible value out of the Internet of Things. But meanwhile, so we're talking about IoT, there's something else really exciting going on over here in a different place. It's the rise of cognitive computing. Now, to understand cognitive, we've got to go back in time also, but not quite as far as the printing press. To understand cognitive, let's go back to about the year 1900. Computing systems back then were what were called tabulating systems. These were big systems that were hardwired together to solve mathematical problems. And it made a difference, because no longer did you have to have humans crunching numbers, but now machines could do them. But by about the 1940s, we had the beginning of the programmable systems era, because systems finally had enough memory that we began to write complex programs to solve really diverse problems. 
And that's the, that's the era that we know. That's what we've grown up in. I started my career as a programmer, writing code in my sandals and shorts for years under, with the black light on. So that was the programmable systems world. But there's, there's a challenge, and we'll talk about this challenge. But the fact is, we're getting so many processors and so much data in the world. The challenge is, how do we write enough deterministic programs to leverage all this data? But the good news is, now we've got the rise of systems that can begin to understand and learn and be trained. So when we talk about cognitive systems, we really need a word of definition. When we talk about cognition in the human terms, cognition is all about the ability to learn, the ability to understand, the ability to, uh, to, to generate context for what's going on around you. And when we talk about it for machines as well, uh, the machines actually are beginning to understand. The machines are beginning to learn context. We can now create machines that come as a blank slate. I can take one into my home, you can take one into your home, and we train them. We train them according to our own specific environments. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing systems that learn at scale, that reason with purpose, and interact with humans naturally. So we talked about IoT, and we talked about cognitive. So let me tell you, we are not simply in a perfect storm of technology. Actually, we're caught between two perfect storms of technology. That's where we are today. And the challenge, the challenge is to leverage this, both for business advantage, but also for societal gain. How do we help society with all these technologies that are coming to be? So the question I would ask, if I were you, is simply that of, Rick, you've talked about cognitive, you've talked about IoT. Why are you saying these two things are going to come together? So I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. So the fact is, right now, for the first time in human history, we are beginning to replace approximation. We are beginning to replace uh, uh, estimates and guesses with real data. Better? Better? They, they, they keep me so honest. <laughs> For the first time in human history, we're replacing guesses and estimates and approximations with real data. And so instead of saying, oh, that was between 750 and 850 units that moved uh, yesterday. We know it was 787. And so the fact is that we've got now roughly 80% of all data that's ever been created was created in the last two years. But here's the scary thing. 20 years from now, we'll look back on this, quote, era of big data, and we'll realize that this is really the era of tiny data, because it's going to get much bigger. So this is not just happening in one field, in one area, in one topic. The whole world is being rewritten in code. We are moving into a software-defined world. It's changing whole industries. Everything is transforming around us. It is a wonderful time to be a software engineer, to be a, a computer scientist because of these transformations. But it's also mind-boggling. A single oil and gas facility can have as many as 80,000 sensors, 80,000 sensors, and create 15 petabytes of data in its lifetime. How do we leverage all this? Well, the answer is in cognitive systems. The answer is in systems that understand the world through sensing and interaction, that can reason and that can learn from the data. And here's the other thing. You may have noticed that natural language processing is getting very, very good. We are now seeing the era of the glass screen begin to diminish. Now, glass screens will be around for a long time because just as it's easy sometimes to read a book and to get data from that that's harder to grasp through conversation, we're going to need glass screens to gather data that's best visually absorbed. But for everyday interactions with computer systems, the fact is we're going to use our voice, we're going to use a gesture of our hand, we're going to use an expression on our face. And that is how we're going to communicate with computers. So this is the exciting new world that we're, we're heading into right now. And it's easy to say, oh, this is disruptive, this is disruptive, this is disruptive. But if you tell me it's disruptive, I'm going to say, what do you mean disruptive? So let's talk about what we mean by disruptive. So there's really three major ways that cognitive IoT is going to disrupt our lives, the way we work, the way we play. Uh, the first is 
that it's going to create new asset marketplaces. By this, we mean it's going to allow you, allow businesses to buy and sell things that we could never buy and sell before. And we're already seeing this because as companies recognize that they have maybe fleets of vehicles, cars and trucks that aren't being used, before those would just sit vacant and empty on parking lots when they weren't being used. Now you can resell them, you can fractionalize your business and begin to make money off these unused assets. Things like floor space, office space, warehouse space can be sold. It's, there's a direct analogy to what's happened in computing over the last decade from this. So 10 years ago, I sat in the chief information office, uh, chief, the CIO's office for a major American corporation. And he said, Rick, I've got a problem. My problem is that every year I'm spending about 15 to $20 million on big server hardware. But at the end of the year, I realize it's only about 20% utilized because my accounting department needs a big server and my HR department needs a big server and all these other departments need big servers. And he asked me, how can we use virtualization to make better use of our equipment? So the answer, of course, was in the cloud, right? So you begin virtualizing more and more and now you just buy what you need as a service rather than buy big servers and get them configured and, and own them. So the same thing is going to happen here. The same way that we get computational cycles as a service, well now we'll apply that principle to many other things in the world around us. Second major way that cognitive IoT is going to disrupt our lives is in understanding and managing risk. And this has different meanings, okay? So the first way to think about risk is the natural way. It's think about insurance and things like that. So today, car companies, or uh, sorry, uh, car insurance companies are putting instrumentation and telemetry into cars. And so they know if you're a good driver or you're a bad driver. And if you're out there speeding, if you're running red lights, if you're swerving in and out of traffic, they know that and they'll charge you more. And if you're driving safely, they know that and they charge you less. That same principle is going to be applied in many other facets of life. It's about understanding the risk involved in everything around us. But there's a flip side to this, and it's kind of a cool flip side. Because think about credit. Who gets credit? People get credit if they de seem to be a good risk. But the fact is, there are some people that are generalized. They're lumped into a group, and they're felt, oh, those people aren't good, good credit risks, so we won't give them credit. But think about this farmer in sub-Saharan Africa who today doesn't qualify for credit. If in the future we know the condition of her crops, the condition of her business through this instrumentation, suddenly she gets credit. And as whole waves of credit open up, then we start to see huge economic advantages. The third way that cognitive IoT is going to disrupt our lives is in improving efficiency. Quite simply put, we're going to be able to do what we need to do as a society with fewer and fewer inputs. So I'm doing some work in smarter agriculture. And we're looking at, for instance, using drones uh, to do some detailed granular inspection of crops. And so today we make uh, assumptions, we make generalizations about agriculture. We say it's time to irrigate the field, it's time to fertilize the field, it's time to apply pesticide to the field. But in the future, we're going to be able to say this part of the field needs fertilizer, this part needs pesticide, this part needs irrigation. We're going to have the ability to have this granular insight and we're going to know exactly what needs to be done. And again, netting it out, this is going to allow us as a society to get what we need to survive, to thrive with fewer inputs. So all of this is going to increase user engagement and create new forms of value for us as a people. So this is going to change businesses as well. So there are some fundamental changes in business models. So the first thing I would bring up is that we're going to see a move away from passive things and into active agents. So let's think about that a second. You have many, many things in your life today. Increasingly, there's going to be intelligence in those things and those things are going to get to know you. Just as today we have uh, an electric grid where electrons flow and, infra and, and uh, electricity goes from generation stations to your house, increasingly there is going to be an invisible flow of information between the very things around you, not just the computers, 
but now the computers are in everything. And so you're going to have your objects, your possessions, whispering about you, gossiping about you, and, and negotiating on your behalf. The very things that surround you are going to be working to make your life easier. And this becomes a very exciting future. Secondly, we're going to see a real shift away from purchasing items and toward pay for use. We talked about vehicles. We talked about floor space. Obviously, nobody's going to be able to uh, bring me coffee and replace my coffee pot in the morning when I wake up. But uh, there are going to be many different ways in the business world and our personal world where we no longer buy items because now we can have chargeback mechanisms and understand what's being used, how it's being used, and get what we need as a service. This moves uh, an accounting move toward operational expenses. And finally, it also means that companies are going to deliver more and more and more of their value through software. So yes, discrete manufacturing still takes place, but as you have this whispering, gossiping, negotiating world, then we see that lots of value is delivered through software and it's going to become fundamental to companies, even those who don't consider themselves software companies, it's going to be a major part of their strategy. Okay? So I'm going to take a step back and ask you to think about what this future world is going to look like. I would tell you it's going to be a very, very noisy place. The truth is that everything is going to be generating data. And so if you're expecting the delivery of a package, the truck that's bringing it is generating data. And the boxes inside that truck are generating data. And the contents of those boxes are generating data. And now think about extending this over all the trucks on all the streets in your city and all the cities in this country and all the other objects generating data. The question becomes, how do we find the data we need? I, I saw a cartoon 10 years ago, the geek humor, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to show my engineering side, but it said, the good news is there's now infinite storage. The bad news is it requires infinite seek time. And so now if we've got infinite data, that's great. But what if it requires infinite seek time to find what we need? So the answer lies in cognitive agents. Those cognitive agents will be in our computers, they'll be in our tablets, they'll be in our phones, but they'll also be woven into the very fabric around us, maybe even literally the fabric of our clothing. There are systems that understand the context of what you're trying to accomplish and will work for you on your behalf to get you the data you need. If part of your job is understanding when that package will arrive, systems, cognitive systems will get that data for you. If part of your job is understanding uh, the condition of a machine out of the floor, and it seems to be failing, there's data for that, cognitive systems will get that data. If your job involves understanding changing market demands for next month's production run, there's data for that, and cognitive systems will get that. I think of it almost as noise reduction headphones. You can put them on, and they block out everything else except for what you want to hear. Cognitive agents will provide this function for us in the future. So there's another element that cognitive agents are going to play as well, and that is that they are going to help the world increasingly transform to meet our needs. Because what happens is, I've already said, these agents are going to work to help personalize the world for us. They're going to get us what we need. But here's the thing. My needs are different than your needs, and they're different than your needs, and they're different than your needs. And so the question becomes, how do each of these objects transform to meet our needs? So let's do a little thought experiment. So today you start a new job, and you're working for a very sophisticated appliance manufacturer, and your job is to develop, your job is to develop a smart refrigerator. So you think about it a little bit, and you say, what's my smart refrigerator going to do? Well, I've got an idea. Why don't we put a camera inside the refrigerator and have it take a picture of my milk and when the milk gets low, it'll send me a picture and a reorder the milk for me. And you're feeling pretty good about that. But then you think, you know, I think we could do a little bit better than that. What if, what if this smart refrigerator started learning the context around it? And this smart refrigerator now understands that if my kids are home, then we need to order milk sooner than if my kids aren't home. If my kids are off at summer camp, 
then we don't need to order milk so fast. Now it begins to understand context and it gets smarter, it gets more valuable. But we can do even better than that. Let's think about personalization. So I gotta tell you a secret, please don't tell anybody this, but I've been spending a lot of time on the road lately and so I've not been hitting the gym as much as I like to, I've not been running, I'm sorry. So I'm really concerned about calories. So now, whenever I put something into my refrigerator, because it knows me, it's gonna look at what I've put in there and it's gonna say, Rick, you've ordered the full fat version here. You could order the reduced fat. Would you like me to get that for you next time? So now it takes on a very personalized context. It's giving me options that meet my needs. But my friend over here, he doesn't care about that. His company pays very well. He just bought a new Maserati. Maserati convertible, wasn't it? That's right, yes, Maserati convertible. And he was thinking, it's gonna take me a few months to pay off this car. So during the next few months, I should really watch my expenses. And so he wants his refrigerator to analyze everything he puts inside and to tell him lower cost options. And so he puts food in and the refrigerator says, you bought this expensive brand, through an API call to the cloud. Uh, here are options to give you more inexpensive brands. Would you like to order those next time? And he says, yes, please, thank you. So that refrigerator has become personalized for him. But my friend over here is very concerned about sustainability and the future of the earth. And so her refrigerator is going to analyze everything that's put inside of it and give her options for greener packaging, things which are more sustainably farmed, and otherwise things that help her reduce her footprint on the earth. So you get the picture here. I can think of some good ideas for a refrigerator, you can think of some good ideas, but nothing is as powerful as all of our ideas coming together, which is why I believe that ultimately we're gonna have platforms, cognitive IoT platforms that learn our context and will in fact be highly personalized and fragment the way that we view the world. There is a wonderful book, if you haven't read it, called Enchanted Objects by David Rose at MIT's Media Labs. The book again, Enchanted Objects. And in this, he describes how objects will increasingly resonate with our needs. Uh, he describes the first step in building enchanted objects as being connection, connectivity. Uh, devices uh, will have sensors on them and they'll connect to the cloud. They'll upload data, download data, and that's pretty much where we are today. But beyond that, he says devices will become increasingly personalized. They'll get to know us, they'll be able to predict and prescribe for us. And this is the place we're rapidly moving into today. Beyond this, he says devices will become uh, socialized and then basically they will understand you and you, your friends, your colleagues, your family, your peers and they will help adapt to each of you and they'll help smooth interactions between you. Beyond that, he describes two more steps. One, gamification. Objects will work together to add elements of fun into our lives. And then he describes storyfication, storyfication, adding a human narrative into objects. Now, I would argue not every object is gonna need gamification and storyfication, but this is a fascinating way to think about the role that the things around us can take on. If you consider the way that we've interacted with the world all our lives, I would tell you fundamentally, it's about to change. It's about to change in a huge way over the next 10 years or so. So the only way that we are gonna be successful in making this happen is if we focus on user-centric design. We have to be doing things building things that people want to use, where they can get value. So I'd like to propose four design maxims for cognitive IoT. We'll step through them very quickly and then spend a couple minutes on each. So first of all, user benefits must be very easily articulated and sticky. People have to say, yes, this provides real value to my life, and it's got to be value that doesn't wear off after three days or three weeks. Secondly, it's about ease of use. It's about consumability. It's not about complexity. You've got to be focused on design where people can get value very quickly. Thirdly, uh, I say familiarity makes the heart grow fonder. And this is about cognitive. It's systems that get to know you, 
that work for you better after one week than they did after one day and work for you better after a month than they did after one week. And finally, it's about designing for ecosystems and extensibility. It's about ensuring that you have platforms that grow over time and could take on new roles and new functions. So let's, let's delve into each quickly. <laughs> so first of all, user benefits must be easily articulated and, and sticky. Uh, it's true, we're going to have a lot of experimentation. We're going to be going down, uh, creating some MySpace kind of products here. Maybe head in the right direction, but don't quite get there. But we've got to always set a high bar for user design. It's one thing to say, uh, I'm going to create a whiteboard for the office place that prints out the things that are written on it. It's another thing to say, I'm going to create a whiteboard that listens to the conversation in the room, that records the meeting metadata, records who was there, uh, records uh, minutes for the meeting, records action items. Uh, it's one thing to say, I'm going to create instrumentation that I can put on athletes uh, and understand how they're performing. It's another thing to say, we're going to aggregate all this information, look for patterns, and then provide uh, suggestions to the coach, to the manager, to the trainer who can help improve the team's performance. So we have to always be setting higher and higher targets. That's how we're going to get there. And we need to draw from many different sources. Now, imagine that I have a cognitive assistant to help me with my fitness routine in my wearable. And every day it's supposed to give me advice. And I look at it on the first day and it says, exercise more. The second day, it says, exercise more. The third day, it says, exercise more. How valuable is this? Every day, it says the same thing. So it's very deterministic. What we need to do is draw from many different sources. And so it could give me personalized advice about diet, about exercise, about stress levels, about other factors. So when we draw from non-deterministic sources, from many different sources, then we create user value that's highly, uh, highly uh, 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 desirable. Ultimately, we want users to say, how did I ever live without this? Secondly, it's about ease of use. God bless the hackers, the makers, the people that dream in Raspberry Pi. I mean, these are, these are my people. They're the, they're the folks who take these wild ideas and turn it into do-it-yourself reality. But let's face it, if we focus on these people, we don't hit the mass market we need to focus on this question of how do we get things out there that everybody are going to want to use. Uh, I liken it to Bluetooth. When Bluetooth first came out, it took an engineer to figure out how to connect to Bluetooth devices. It was complicated, but now it's trivial. A 12-year-old can connect Bluetooth just as easily as an 82-year-old. And because, that's because we focused on interoperability and ease of use. Uh, there are organizations out there today in the world of IoT uh, organizations, alliances, consortia, uh, you think about LoRa, MQTT, Allseen, a handful of others who are working on this interoperability question. Embrace them. Embrace these organizations who are helping break down barriers. Uh, ultimately, in the professional world, if we don't focus on ease of use, companies are going to have to hire a whole huge staffs to put this stuff in place and to administer it, and it's going to collapse under its own weight. And certainly, nobody is going to want to use these devices in their personal life. So if we focus, again, on getting quick consumption, quick, uh, quick value, then it's a real plus. I want devices out there that my 69-year-old mother, without an engineering degree, can get value from. That's the target. Thirdly, I said familiarity makes the heart grow fonder. This is fundamentally about cognitive capabilities. Uh, I would say that the system needs to learn you, they need to learn your priorities, they need to learn what you're trying to accomplish, and they need to then actively work to help you accomplish this. Now, to do so really means four things. To make good cognitive systems, you need to have fundamentally machine learning. They need to understand norms, patterns of behavior, and they need to be able to figure out how to react to those patterns of behavior, machine learning. Secondly. It's about natural language processing. And not just speech to text. Yeah, that's nice. Text to speech. It's also about developing a rich, deep, nuanced understanding of the semantic structure of my words. 
It's about understanding emotional content of my words. If I say, uh, that's a really nice device, maybe I sound sincere. If I say, no, that's a really nice device, then I'm being ironic. So you have to be able to understand the, through tonal analysis what a person really means. So again, the second thing we want is natural language processing with a great degree of sophistication. The third thing we need is advanced text analytics. And the text analytics should have the same degree of understanding nuance as the NLP, the natural language processing. How can devices read and understand what they're reading? And the fourth thing that we want to have is advanced image and video analytics. Just as the same way we understand the world comes from many different sources, including our hearing, giving devices the ability to see, to understand what they're seeing, and to make decisions based on this will give us systems that truly get to know us, that truly learn about us, and can make decisions on our behalf. Fourthly, it's about ecosystems and extensibility. I think you saw this in the refrigerator example I used a few minutes ago. I can have some good ideas, you have some good ideas, you have some good ideas, but the best platform is one that will ultimately tap into all our good ideas. We're not there yet, but I would love to see a future where we've got these broad ecosystems at play. And this is not just, okay, this is not just a uh, hypothetical situation, it's reality. Because if we look back, that's hard to see from there, isn't it? I'll explain it to you. If you look at mobile phone profits from back about nine years ago, Nokia made all, uh, over half of the profits in the world from mobile phones. And there are a bunch of other names down below that. And the reason is, nine, 10 years ago, mobile phones were exactly that. There were devices that you'd send text on, you'd talk on, maybe you'd download a game. But what happened over the next nine years? Well, we've seen that all the profits in the world for mobile phones really come from two companies, Apple and Samsung. And why is this? It's because instead of focusing on the product, they focused on creating a platform through which rich ecosystems can grow. And now today, if you have an idea, you can write an app, and I, who live a thousand miles away, can take advantage of it. And if I have an idea, I can write an app, and you can take advantage of it. By creating these platforms, they've created products that continually extend their capabilities, extend their functionality, and they've achieved, uh, really, the market leadership positions. So I would tell you, ultimately, as we march down this cognitive IoT path, we need to be focused on how we can mix and match, how we can interoperate, and how we can create platforms that allow each of us to contribute to the, to the uh, end results. So pulling it all together, wrapping it up, IoT is going to liquefy the world. It's going to create new asset marketplaces. It's going to create new understanding and management of risk. And it's going to create greater efficiencies for our society. Cognitive is what's going to hone those, as, uh, those attributes because this world of big data we live in now, you haven't seen anything yet. And cognitive solutions are going to be key to harnessing that big data. Additionally, cognitive and understanding the individual is going to allow these devices to really bend themselves to meet our needs. Thirdly, we need to focus on user-centric design, put users first, and start asking ourselves questions about what form these devices should take. And I would tell you, it's going to be an amazing journey, an amazing ride. IBM looks forward to being your partner and your, uh, your listening board for the next decade, the next two decades, as we start walking down this journey. So thank you very much for your time today. Uh, with the Internet of Things, uh, the products maybe know me better than I will know myself. But uh, what about security? <laughs> so, uh, so the question is, what about security in these devices? That is a major topic. Uh, right now, we are working hard on security, uh, certainly by embracing open source and open standards. Then everybody gets to see what's under the covers. And then you have a higher feeling for security than if you're using some proprietary solution. The other thing is, I would say, companies that have advanced analytics are applying those to solve the security problem. Because it, we live in a deperimeterized world. It used to be we put a firewall around something and keep the bad guys out. But now if your data is everywhere and your devices are everywhere, how do you build a wall?
So it's about applying analytics to understand what is normal, what is not normal, and then taking action. Uh, finally, I would say the big uh, organizations and companies that are concerned most about security today are those that have regulatory requirements. And so I'm working with banks and with hospitals on these topics, and they have huge issues we're working through. Uh, but I think those same concerns are going to be coming down to the masses, and you need to keep us, the companies that provide these solutions, honest, because we want to do the right thing, but it's got to be a continuing conversation about security this year, next year, and for years to come. Next question. Hi. Hi. Uh, I work in marketing, so my question is about marketing. Okay. Because we saw a video at the beginning of the presentation uh -huh. about IBM. Uh, do you think that Apple, Macintosh, could be the next bad guy in this industry if they continue with the closed system and their all cables and that kind of things? I'm sorry, repeat the part of the Apple Macintosh, please. Uh, could be they the bad guys in the future if they don't work with open source ah. and that kind You were the bad guys in the past, <laughs> and you continue working on that. That's why we, uh, we saw that video, no? You know, I will tell you at a personal level, I have a, a love-hate relationship with Apple, and I'm sure there's some Apple people here today. Uh, I philosophically believe in open standards and open source. And uh, IBM began embracing this back around 1996 when we embraced Linux. We realized that open source was the right thing for our customers because it allowed them to create uh, basically functionality capabilities very cheaply. And we realized we could no longer fight that. And we focused on building higher level uh, skills and capabilities on top of that open source. I still believe that's the right way to go. That said, I use an Apple. So <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's sort of a mixed message there. Uh, you know, the jury is still out. Ultimately, the consumers will need to decide what the right solutions are in this space in cognitive IoT. Uh, I personally hope that open standards and open source wins the day, but you're the one who will decide what wins. We've got to deliver good capabilities, good value, and let you vote with the dollar, with the peso. Next question. Yes. OK. Uh, now that IBM is building Watson and is in, onto this cognitive industry, uh, where the ethical discussions are around the human decisions, how, how that is seen? Because you, you mentioned about a refrigerator. And what if the system? He's suggesting me something I really don't want, but I don't know that I don't want it. Well, you know, so there's so many different ways I can answer this question, right? So uh, first of all, nobody will force you to use any of these capabilities. The same way that today you might think that Google Now gives you really powerful functions and you want to use it, but you can also opt out. Uh, and not, you know, say, I don't want to be tracked, and so I won't use Google now. Uh, I would say with these cognitive solutions, to a great degree as well, you will be able to opt out. I think over time it will get harder and harder to opt out. Uh, so that's a societal conversation that we need to have. Because if we do not, uh, as an active population, have these conversations, they'll be made for us. And so we need to be involved as, as uh, citizens, as, as individuals. Uh, the other... Uh, element I got from your question uh, is around what we do for a living and, you know, kind of the, what is the human element that we bring to our jobs. So there's always going to be uh, supplanting of people, the same way that the railroad took away jobs, the same way that the uh, weaving mill took away jobs. Uh, society as a whole advanced because of you know, the elevation in capabilities that was, was uh, delivered. Right now, we have a perfect storm of technology coming down that's transforming things faster than we've ever seen in history. And again, uh, it's, it's frightening for many of us who have children particularly saying, wow, what is the future of work going to look like 25 or 30 years from now? Uh, I would say, again, this is the kind of conversation we need to have. 
both technologically and uh, in governmental bodies and, and learning how we want to structure our societies. So there's a lot of ways we could talk about that. And I would have loved to have this conversation over a beer. <laughs> yes, another question. Who, Eric. Who hey, first of all, thanks for being here. It was uh, such a great talk, such an honor to have you here. My pleasure. Uh, the question is, does e IBM offer any kind of open source or free tools or something that people like us can use to try to build, you know, uh, uh, or to explore this uh, cognitive computing in, in our applications to try to improve the society and of why not make some business as well? Okay, I want you to go into the room over here and you're going to be learning all about Bluemix. Do you know about Bluemix today? Uh, no. All right, I got somebody right here who's going to tell you about Bluemix. Okay. So Bluemix is IBM's platform as a service. And I've tried not to make this too much about IBM, marketing, marketing, mar no offense to my marketing friend over here. But, uh, you know, uh, Bluemix is our platform as a service, and we make cognitive APIs available to people. So if you want to begin coding with cognitive APIs, we have a way for you to do that. Okay? Fantastic, thanks. You're welcome. We had some questions over here. Oh, go ahead. Hi. Hello. Uh, which problems or what is our main stopper in order to achieve the IoT? What, are we that close to the IoT future? We are already in the IoT future. <laughs> and let me, uh, let me give you a few examples. So I'm working with uh, car companies who basically have all these sensors in their car and they're looking at ways that cars can learn their drivers better. And all this data is pulled back into IoT platform where we can run sophisticated analytics on it. And so today I'm working with companies who are planning to introduce functionality that know uh, how you like the temperature setting, what kind of radio stations you like, you know, where you like your seat setting, but also may learn things like um, your, your driving patterns and where you like to go. So, for instance, every morning, if you stop for coffee between 8.30 and 9, and you go to another city, your car may suggest to you, hey, here's a coffee shop, you can stop between 8.30 and 9. So that's one example, but we're working with uh, transportation companies, again, putting IoT in place. We're working with airframe manufacturers, putting IoT into jets. Whereas in the past, we made broad generalizations. This plane must get a certain kind of maintenance every 100 hours. Now we know if it's been flying through a lot of turbulence, it needs that maintenance every 60 hours. If it's buying, been flying through clear skies, it can go 150. So we're already seeing companies across the board getting value from IoT. The question we have is how do we take it to the next level? Okay. Thank you. Over this way. Oh. oh, what's that? That was the last question? No. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm going to make myself available. These people are my handlers right here. Come find me, come find them. I'll be close to them and I'll answer whatever questions you have, okay? And thank you again very much. It's been a real pleasure.